beautiful drive up from where I live, which is uh, around Trinity Center over Scott Mountain and the Gazelle Road. Love it. So, um, my name is Carol Fall. Uh, I work for part time for the University of California Corporate Extension Office in Trinity County. Uh, and the other part of the time, um, I'm a small business owner and I also, with my husband, own 45 acres of um, Timberland in Trinity. So I'm kind of covering a lot of little bases when I talk about uh, special quartz products, I mean, from different aspects. Um, and I have to say, so this is the view from my property up into the Alps. Wow, and nice. it's, it looks like that. It's thickly forested, dug fir, white fir, incense cedar, and it needs a lot of help. So um, we're out there every weekend whacking down trees and wondering what are we going to do with all this stuff. Um, I want to ask you guys kind of a little bit about your demographics. So how many of you are in the, like, owning zero to ten acres of forest land? And maybe ten to fifty. And fifty to hundred. Hundred and ten. So mostly would you think of yourself as small forest landowners? Because that's where most of these are. This column on the left, uh, the, the axis on the left, has uh, in thousands the numbers of landowners. So one to nine acres. There's like a hundred thousand landowners in California that have one to nine forest land acres. You know, and, and a green bar in the middle is the 50 acres and less. So that's where all the the numbers of landowners are. It's 50 acres or less. There's a few landowners that, you know, out here that own a lot of acres, but there's very few people that own big chunks. Most of us own just little pieces, and that is the trend. There's this forest fragmentation where the big pieces keep getting broken down into smaller and smaller parcels. So you have landowners who don't own very much, they want to take care of it, and they know it costs money, and they're trying to figure out how do you some of those costs, how do you still make money on these really smaller parcels? Um, because this is this is this National Woodland Owner Survey, it's pulling out the data just for California, and small forest landowners are still cutting trees because they're doing road maintenance, they're doing fire hazard reduction, uh, they're not doing the commercial harvest. 5% of those landowners are the ones that own the big tracks. All the rest of us that own the smaller tracks, we're still out there cutting down trees, doing all our projects, trying to figure out what to do with those trees. So that's kind of where we're at. What do we do with the trees? So that's what, what, I, want to, that's what I want to talk about tonight is not um, kind of the big things like selling timber or saw logs or getting equip money from NRCS or biomass or conservation easements. Those are you know, kind of more commercial things. I want to talk about my goal, which is how do I get enough money to pay for my chainsaw gas and get my chainsaw sharpened and put a little bit of money away to buy equipment to manage my property. That's kind of where I'm headed. Um, and maybe if I can pay for some of, my, some of my time, that would be wonderful, but you know, I'm just mostly trying to on I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what you can do with custom sawn lumber because it is a question that we get a lot and then um, neighborhood associations because what you'll find is that if you just have a real small parcel it's hard to make money or aggregate enough stuff to sell. A lot of times the only way it works is if you're part of a larger group. So briefly, these are the kind of things that you can sell other than saw logs and all that. You know, you can sell firewood, posts and poles, chips, mulch or bark, Christmas trees, uh, woodworking craft material. Uh, I'll show you processed products and herbs, herbs and edibles. Um, there are more things in this publication. Um, I have copies of uh, some of the websites that are on this so that you don't need to write those down if you want to just pass that out. So that 
You can download this document. It's about 20 years old. It is 20 years old, but it's um, it's got a lot of good suggestions and it's got a lot of uh, ideas just on things that you can try to sell. Um, and so you can either download it or you can buy it on Amazon or something if you want uh, to look at that. Yeah, so the first thing I want to talk about is firewood. Um, so firewood is tricky. As we were just saying, um, the price of firewood seems to track uh, the price of heating oil and natural gas. When those come down, the price of firewood comes down. People shift back and forth. Um, so uh, there is a market, though, for firewood. You need to make sure, because firewood is specifically one of the things that's listed under the Forest Practices Act, that if you are going to harvest trees to generate firewood, you need to have some sort of authorization. Um, I'll kind of mention some exemptions at the end that maybe apply. Um, there are other firewood concerns about air quality. There are a lot of places in the state where people can't buy firewood or can't burn firewood. And, um, there's a lot of concern about uh, transmission of disease. For a while, the tendency was to have these huge processing facilities with the um, firewood processing machines where they would generate firewood and ship it all over the state. Um, the state's actually trying to discourage that because of disease transmission. So they have a campaign now called Buy It Where You Burn It. And that actually helps small forest landowners. It's like boutique firewood. They want you to buy firewood from local vendors, from local wood. Um, and they're really pushing this. They have all these posters and uh, kind of marketing materials. That website is the firewood.ca.gov. And um, uh, what they're trying to do are things like have a Google Earth, they have some apps for an iPhone where you could look for local firewood processors. Um, so that helps the small, small guy. It takes it away from those huge statewide firewood processor shippers and puts it back on the small local stuff. Kind of your whole firewood version of the buy local, know your farmer, know your food campaign. So anyway. Go to that website if you're thinking about selling firewood and look at all the little marketing things they have and, and take advantage of those. Um, if you are going to sell firewood, I mean right now in Trinity, uh, fur is running around $200 a quarter, cut, split, and delivered. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've generated a lot of firewood and that's a lot of work. And so then I look and I go, $200 a quarter, wow. Um, so, and you have to be real careful about cord. Uh, it's about $150 a truckload, $200 a cord. Our ag commissioner is pretty much on the, I want to see how you measured your cord. So if you're going to sell it by the cord, you've got to be careful. Make sure that you um, meet the definition, you know, the four foot by four foot by eight foot uh, uh, wood for a cord. Um, so there is the option to just sell bulk firewood. Um, there is, um, what a couple of our people have done is sell, sold, downed firewood. Um, we've had windstorms, snowstorms the last few years that have taken down a bunch of trees. So once they're dead, downed trees, you don't need to go to cow fire and get the authorization to lay it on the ground. And you didn't do that. You didn't cut them. You didn't push them over. Um, and so we have one guy that basically just says, you come to my property, I will mark and show you where all the down trees are. You pay me $25 a truckload. And then he has some people essentially doing his fuel reduction work for him. Uh, we do the same thing. We call it the Tom Sawyer approach, but we do it for, um, vertical trees, live trees. We go each year to a certain area of our property and we mark the trees that we want someone to take out. We have three, four friends 
that come up and they take out those trees and they take them away and they burn them for firewood. We're not selling them, so we don't need the Cal Fire authorization. And so, and those people aren't selling them. Um, and so it's essentially getting our um, fuel reduction projects in some of our areas done for free. Anyway, it's not bringing in an income, but it helps. Could you go into that authorization process for if you wanted to sell firewood from your Yeah, project? so um, I'll talk a little bit more later about the forest practice rules. For a lot of you, if you're going to sell firewood, you might want to apply for the uh, exemption that allows you to take up to 10% of the average volume of your uh, wood stand as firewood and sell that. You have to have an LTO um, if you're going to do that, but you don't have to have the RPF. So you, can, you have the licensed timber operator and it's cheaper uh, to apply for that exemption than the RPF. We'll talk about that options a little more later. Um, I do want to say marketing firewood is kind of an art. Um, so here's the thing. Bulk firewood to me is a lot of work for the amount of money you get. Um, there's these other ways where you can get a minimum amount of money by, by essentially having someone come onto your property and do the work for you. There's a liability issue there. The up and coming thing is bundled firewood, um, kind of the Starbucks approach. A lot of people won't buy $200 for a truckload or a quart of firewood, but they'll stop at the grocery store a couple times a week and buy their $8 bundle. I mean, they're paying way more on, you know, in total for their firewood, but that's the way they think. That, okay, I'll buy my $5 cup of coffee, I'll buy my $8 bundle of firewood. Fine. The trick with that is you have to really be a good marketer. So this drives me crazy. Trinity County, Weaverville, our main grocery store, our only grocery store, sells firewood, and it is almond wood from the valley. We have a county that's full of trees, way overstocked, burns like crazy in our forest fires, but they bring up almond wood from the valley. So why does he do that? I've asked him that. Um, because the guy that sells that is professional. He has it bundled, it's barcoded, it comes on a pallet when he orders it. The guy who's selling it gives him an invoice. Um, and so the store owner buys it from him. Because he used to buy it from local vendors and they, they didn't barcode it, it wasn't wrapped very well. Um, they would expect to be paid in cash instead of, you know, providing an invoice. So the, the store owner just said, forget it. So um, we're in the process of, um, my husband and I, of um, purchasing a, a bundler. Uh, we've gotten the paper instead of the shrink wrap, you know, to put our little logo and our sustainably harvested stuff on there. Uh, we've added the little things of kindling, you know, to help market it. And, you know, so we're going to, as soon as we get my LTO, go to class tomorrow in Wairika, we will start selling harp and, you know, marketing firewood again. So, anyway, it's an art. You have to be very professional, very businesslike if you're going to do the bundled firewood thing. Um, I also have to say you have to, have to educate the public. Um, we sold firewood years ago when I had a Class C timber license, and now they changed to have an LTO. Um, I had, uh, we live on Highway 3, which is within our, within our house are 13 Forest Service campgrounds. So I thought, oh, there's all these people coming up to camp. I will sell them firewood, right? I have my little fire firewood stand at the end of my driveway. These people pull in. I have two piles of firewood. One is all the little small diameter stuff that we cut that we're thinning out to make our forest healthier. And the other is really punky pine that we just split to kind of help get the fire started. Every one of those Bay Area City people said, I want that stuff that's triangular. That's firewood. That kind of stuff, that's not firewood. 
and I could not convince them that the punky pine was going to disappear within about two minutes once they lit it. <laughs> but that was where the BTUs were. Every time I tried to convince them, it was like, you were just local yokel trying to put something over on me. And so I kept arguing with the customers, which is another thing you're not supposed to do when you're marketing. But anyway, um, so I decided you really need to have some sort of education campaign that that small diameter stuff is great firewood because it's dense, lots of BTUs, people just don't get it. Especially the boutique firewood buyers who are going to do their Starbucks cup and their bundle of firewood. They don't know. You have to educate them. Um, there's also a small market for posts and poles. Um, we're lucky in Trinity that the Watershed Center has a post and pole peeler. Um, so they will buy from our local landowners um, a truckload of poles. This is one of those things where a lot of times a landowner does not have enough for a truckload of poles, so they kind of have to gather, get together with their neighbors and say, okay, we're going to have the truck come, everybody come and bring their poles, and then we'll send them off to the watershed center. So um, we use them for things like there's a you know pavilion at our one of our local parks. The watershed center sells these little gazebo kits. If you go to the Forest Products Lab website, they have tons of plans for things that you can build with poles. Um, and so, and, and I've sold poles off our property to to contractors um, who are trying to build decks and things like that, and they want to use the poles for the under supports instead of uh, four by fours. So anyway, there is a market for, for poles. Uh, and split cedar rails too. We've also sold split cedar rails. Um, there's a market for landscape chips, uh, mulch, bark. Um, we have a landscape company in Weaverville that buys uh, chips. Um, how much he pays really depends on um, the quality of the chips. Um, I've sold him chips and what I have to do is pull out all the little sticks, the little tiny sticks and the needles before I run it through the chipper because he doesn't want all that stuff. He wants it to look nice. So, you know, you have to figure out your labor time versus how much he's going to pay you. Sometimes he wants it delivered, you know, all that kind of stuff. But anyway, I have gone and um, sold chips to, to landscapers. Um, later about cedar chips. I have not found a market for Christmas trees. Um, there is a group there, this uh, CAChristmas.com, that's the California Christmas Tree Association. If you go to their website, they are really good at marketing Christmas trees. Um, but if you look on the try to buy Christmas trees in Trinity, Shasta, or Siskiyou counties, there's no vendors that show up. And that's, I think, because it's so easy to just get your permit from the Forest Service and go out and wind down a tree if you really want to get a live Christmas tree. Um, they have a nice calculator on there that shows a uh, radius from an urban area, like how to figure out the economic feasibility of selling Christmas trees. But um, I think with us, out of kind of the environment that we live in, there's just, our urban areas are still way too close to the national forests. So I have not found anybody who's made any money on Christmas trees. Um, you do have people that make money on what I call weird stuff, um, which is the true special force products, actually. Um, I have sold uh, pine cones, the sugar pine cones. If you ever check out eBay, you know, and just put in sugar pine cones or manzanita or burls or something, all this stuff shows up that people sell. The price has gone, come, gone down. At one time, I was selling the cones for four dollars each. Now they're about a dollar each, or it's about twenty dollars for a box. Um, I mostly sell them actually to a, um, a craft place down in the Bay Area, in Alameda. Um, 
Um, but anyway, you can sell sugar flying clones. You can sell, I don't know, do any of you guys have manzanita? Manzanita is actually a big thing, the manzanita sticks. Um, our local pet store buys those for um, uh, little perches for birds. Um, she also buys cedar chips. So um, uh, I'll explain that. We, we had, um, we donate boughs to wreath making. And so we take out a lot of little cedar trees and send cedar trees and then cut all the boughs off. So you end up with just these sticks with no needles on them. And so I run those through the chipper. Actually, our small, um, uh, kind of typical homeowner chipper it makes small chips. And she uses those to make uh, personalized dog and cat beds because they're little fluffy chips. So, um, so anyway, the local pet store buys them, and she uses them to make to make dog beds with the dog's name on it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, animal bedding is one of the things that they use. Forest products for, especially if you have cedar. Um, anyway, that's pretty much the kind of I don't know, weird things you can sell. You'd be surprised. I'm tr truly surprised what kind of things people will buy. Especially, I mean, we had the forest fires in Trinity in 2008. The Forest Service uh, firefighters that came from the eastern half of the United States, a bunch of them came from from east of the Mississippi, we're literally shipping boxes and boxes of the sugar pine cones back across the, the country. The post office wow. thought it was the funniest thing ever wow. because they were like, look at these pine cones, these are just awesome. So anyways, things that we take for granted, other people will buy. Yeah. We've also sold mistletoe, especially when our boys were little, they would like to harvest the mistletoe and they would put ribbons on it. Uh -huh. And go door to door, stand in front of the. Yeah, they love to buy it for little kids, you know. They're good enough for them in the 30s. But they would sell them for a dollar a piece and come back with 10, 15 bucks in the pocket every time they go out. Stuff you take for granted, mm -hmm. stuff that I throw in my burn pile. Later, someone will say, Wow, ah, I can't believe you burnt that. I would have loved to have that burl or something. The stuff I've talked about so far is kind of like your basic forest products with a minimum of processing. You've split the firewood or peeled the poles or run it through a chipper or something like that. There is a market for stuff that's called value-added products where you do some additional processing. Um, we have a, a vendor in Weaverville that makes these you know, seasonal wreaths and swags. And so she has one of those wreath machines, which they cost a couple thousand bucks. Um, but she sells those for you know fifty to hundred bucks a pop. So um, and Weaverville is a really small town. She makes about five thousand dollars in a month, you know, because it's very limited season. Uh, I talked to to people down in uh, Sonoma County, and, and one of the floral guys there that he grosses about $50,000 a year selling wreaths from, from just, you know, the evergreens. So, um, I don't know what his net was, but anyway, there, there is a market for that kind of thing. Um, she does it where she sells stuff to all the merchants and then she lets the charitable groups use the machine to make a little bit of money selling wreaths and swags that the kids make. And so, we donate the the bottles for that. So that's why I was talking about where, where we're kind of taking all the cedar trees and dug fern, tripping on, trimming off the ends of the greenery and donating it to a charity. We haven't really tried selling that myself yet. And we have another couple, they just left, um, that does a lot of stuff with incense cedar. Um, do any of you have incense cedar on your property? Okay, so they, they actually sell the trees. He pots up the trees and sells the little trees. He collects the boughs and sells the, the ground-up cedar as incense. Um, they take the needles and make these little cedar sachets. I mean, and they sell tons of this stuff at the farmer's market. 
So um, incense cedar, actually, there's a lot of, of things uh, from the um, just from the I don't know what you call it, home market that it, that that you can sell. There's another big company I'll show you later that sells the smudge sticks too. Like those those they made, but these are you can buy commercially. Um, last thing I want to talk about is in terms of just stuff you're going to pull off your property are the, the herbs and edible stuff. So I would have to say I have a guy that comes on my property every year and collects mushrooms. And he gives me, you know, a certain percent of the mushrooms because I'm too terrified to collect them myself. But I have no idea how much money he makes off of them. I'm sure way more than I don't want to know about. Um, there are other edible or herbal products that they have done studies on, economic feasibility studies, and the studies have said it's economically feasible to sell these other products like Oregon Grape, Prince's Pine, uh, St. John's Wort and stuff. But I would have to say, in Trinity, and this might be one of our things, um, none of those have panned out over the long term. They've started out with some sort of grant or a business incubator kind of free rent or something that financially propped them up. But then over the long term, when those subsidies went away, the businesses went away. And I'm not sure if that's because a couple of them were like really pre-internet you know, marketing and some of them were kind of just not very good businessmen, I think. Um, but you know, according to the Forest Service, uh, those, um, you know, kind of herbal products are feasible to sell. So, anyway, I don't know about that. All I can say is it hasn't worked out where we are. Um, this, this particular thing here is put out by Juniper Ridge, and they, I would encourage you to look at their website. It's on my handout. Um, they sell Douglas fir tip tea. Um, these, all these cedar products, um, Douglas fir soaps, and all that kind of stuff. And so, and they sell in hundreds of stores. They sell through Whole, Wheat, Whole Foods Market and all over the country. And essentially, all they're doing is wildcrafting. They're taking these properties and just harvesting the dug fir needles, the wild sage, the incense cedar, and they're making lots of stuff out of it. Um, we've tried to convince them to come up and um, harvest the Weaverville's community forest, you know, as a way to kind of um, make some money for the community forest. And they've sent people up and looked at the community forest, but they've said, well, right now they, they have more um, sources than they need. But I want to encourage you to look at them as an example of, if you're into the true entrepreneurial part, um, what the kinds of products are that people will buy. It's, it's more than I ever thought. Before we can move uh, past herbs and edibles, uh, what's the process, or do you know, uh, or the time frame for getting uh, organic certification for, say, mushrooms and other edibles? So if you're wildcrafting, if you're harvesting things from your property, I actually don't think that you get organic certification. So organic certification through USDA is going to be for, um, um, you know, farm products. So, so then, you know, yeah, I mean, then the standard is, you know, you, you have to um, have not used uh, uh, chemical uh, fertilizers, certain pesticides, and things like that uh, for three years. Um, and they, you know, you can use certain organic uh, pesticides, um, but you, um, the whole organic thing is more geared towards farming versus wildcrafting and forestry, just harvesting. So um, I don't really know that you can get an organic certification for a forest harvest kind of thing. I would think that would be an advantage since there's kind of a paradigm shift, you know, with consumers wanting uh, organic produce and products more than ever. And when you consider that a lot of forest managers do use herbicides in their uh, 
fuel reduction and so forth, uh, you know, that could be a concern of consumers. It yeah, could. I've seen some that are sold that is marketed as so organic. I've seen some, like some of the products she's mentioned. And they I mean, you say it. I don't know how they get certified. Well, they do maple syrup. Some places. Yeah, that's true. Um, it might be farming too. So we we have, need to check with USDA on that. You could. I mean, we had we actually had a class last year on organic certification, and, and um, I'm pretty sure at the time that they were saying wild crafting per se didn't qualify for uh, organic certification. But you know, I don't know something more intense like um, the maple syrup. I don't know how that fits in. Um, but they. You know, there are, so organic is one um, descriptor of the qual quality of the product. Local, sustainable, uh, I mean, for wild crafting, it, it's really important to find something that is mar marketable, that you don't over-harvest it, that you do it at a sustainable level. I mean, and if you are selling other forest products, if you say, if we have found, if you, if you say this is done to make the forest healthier, to um, reduce the risk of c catastrophic fires, then that's a marketing tool there too. So organic is is one, you know, box. But I would say if you don't, if you don't, if you can't get organic, there's other ways to still get the message across. That sure. Okay. Um, Thank you. So another website I would recommend that you look at is that warforestdirectory.com. That's the Oregon um, kind of a uh, central repository. It, it's got the Oregon Small Woodlands Association members. It's got a bunch of trade groups have this group website. So you get on that website and say, who sells firewood? Who sells special forest products? And then it breaks them all down into like animal bedding and all that kind of stuff. And they actually list um, vendors that are outside of Oregon up to Washington and Northern California. So um, you can um, have, if you're selling firewood or something like that, you can get on that directory and people then can go to that website and start seeing, okay, well, that person sells manzanita sticks or, you know, sugar pine cones. They have like a special listing for sugar pine cones and stuff. So, so I would encourage you to take advantage of that kind of stuff if you're starting to really market, try and market your stuff. Um, and you do need to know the forest practice regulations. Um, a few words about those. I mean, some things that you're harvesting like pine cones and stuff, you don't need. Uh, Cal Fire's authorization for. But if you're selling uh, firewood, uh, chips, posts and poles, you need some sort of authorization. You're not going to want a timber harvest plan. I mean, the average cost for those is around $30,000, and, and I think it's gone up. Um, but they do have exemptions. You can get an exemption for the 150 feet around your house. Um, you can get an exemption, and that one you can apply for yourself. You can get an exemption if you're cutting trees and selling the stuff. Uh, that's a three acre conversion. Um, that has to be applied for by an RPF. Uh, there is that exemption for dead, dying, and diseased trees. And then for fuel wood, if you're taking out uh, firewood and it's less than 10% of the average volume kind of, of of your forest stand, that you have to have a LTO sign the application. Um, so you know you can just get on the Cal Fire website, which is not easy. You know you don't want to have to read the Forest Practices Act. Trust me, that's um, 353 pages. But if you look at the form page, where it's got the forms for the exemptions, you can look at the form and you can say, I can fill that out and it will qualify me for this. I mean, the form page is actually kind of a little easier to use. And
then you can do what I do. I call my Cal Fire guy down in Reading and I just ask dumb questions all the time. I want to do this. What kind of options do I have? You know, so anyway, you can explain what you want to do. He'll tell you kind of what your different venues are. Um, if you, yeah. I have a quick question about exemptions. Is that something that needs to be done on a one landowner to one landowner basis, or is that something that, you know, a couple of adjacent landowners are working together on a project, they could apply for one exemption that would apply for whatever they want to do? Um, I've asked Cal Fire that. Last time I asked them that, um, they all had to turn in, it, for the exemptions, they had to turn in an individual um, application. They could get together, you know, as a group and hire the LTO or the RPF or whatever, the, whoever they needed to, to prepare the notice for them. Um, and sometimes you get a better rate if, you know, the guys out there are just doing a, you know, a cruise or doing a form for everybody. But, um, but everybody had to turn in their own. Every Timberland owner has to sign separately. Um, so yeah, I think that's the way that they'll make you work that. Um, if you start deriving an income from your property, you know, there are uh, timber yield t tax uh, requirements in California, but I can tell you, I mean, the limit is $3,000 a quarter, so you have to make 12000 bucks a year with your supplemental little selling of stuff. So if you could do that, that good, you're doing pretty good. I mean, if I make... You know, we make maybe a thousand bucks a quarter, or something like that. Like said, I'm, I'm buying equipment and paying for chainsaws. That's about it. Um, but you do have to also deal with federal income tax. You know, like you have to start filling out Schedule F or something. You know, to report your um, your timber income, forestry income. So if you start making money, you got to pay taxes. Um, I want to just talk for a few minutes about the custom saw and lumber because um, that has changed. So if you are on your property and you're cutting down your trees, you have somebody come in and mill the lumber for you or you take the lumber to them and they mill it and you bring it back. If you're not selling that lumber, you're just using it on your property, you don't need to get the, the cow fire exemption stuff. So you can use that lumber then on your property for um, non-structural uses, non-load supporting uses, um, unless you have it graded. So graded, having a grader come to your property is pretty expensive. I only know one person that did that, and they built a whole house from lumber on their property. So that was worth their while. But uh, most of the time, uh, people just use it for non-load supported uses. So you can use it for, like, that picture was the guy that came to our property and built a bunch of lumber for us. He made a bunch of 4x4s, 6x6s that we have used for sheds, you know, things that are below the minimum size for the building code. Um, we used it for uh, trim for decks, just for all kinds of weird, you know, garden beds, all that weird stuff. So you can get essentially cheap lumber for your property. Uh, it was about a quarter of the cost of buying lumber from the uh, lumber yard. That might just be county specific though, right? Because I know a guy in Siskiyou County that did his stuff off of his own place. Would it, any, Use, yeah, but did he, yeah, did he use, so, did he use the uh, lumber off his place for load-bearing? Oh, yeah, his, his, his house is framed with pine boards off of his property. Sometimes it, it is dependent on your particular building department. Our building department will let you use um, oversized dug fur. Yeah, he had to use oversized as well. Yeah. He had to use oversized as well, yep. statewide building code that says uh, limited density, density or built rural dwellings can use other produced lumber.
Selmer, and that's the, the um, language that, that the individual building departments interpret differently and use differently. So some counties are more stringent than others. So I'm curious. Even but doing the oversight, you still save a lot of money, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, but there, the changes that I want to talk to you about are for the, the WUI building code. So in January 2008, um, the new building code that's supposed to reduce the uh, fire hazard of your home came into effect. And so that changed the building code, started to limit what you could use your own lumber for. Um, that building code change applies to new buildings. It doesn't apply to outbuildings like garages or additions to an existing structure. So um, you can still use things like dug fur for siding, decking in those additions and garages. Um, you can't use dug fur or si for siding or decking anymore on new buildings. Um, that's because the fire risk. So where we use dug fur for our deck when we built our house, you could not do that anymore. Um, Would that apply to sheds, things under 120 square feet? No. But it doesn't apply to, to homes. To outbuildings. So there are some woods like cedar that can still be used for siding and decks because they consider those to be ignition resistant. So anyway, you, you know, a lot of people use their um, milled on-site lumber for stuff, but the, the kind of what you can use it for narrowed a little bit with that new movie building code. Um, last thing I want to talk about is kind of just getting together with your neighbors. Um, because you truly will find, like I, I do, I mean, I don't have enough timber that I've harvested any one time to make a log truck. So, or even to make a pole truck to send to the post and pole peeler. Um, I'm lucky if I make a pickup truck bed full of chips when I want to sell chips. So, um, what I do is get together with my neighbors. Um, we, I will say, if any of you have applied for EQIP, if you uh, can get together with your neighbors and apply for EQIP as a group, you get a higher point score uh, when you're doing the rankings. So we did that. That was pretty easy. Um, don't be too intimidated. I'm just, there's different types of organizations if you're going to get together with your neighbors. I'm only going to talk about the first three. Because the bottom ones, you've got to be making a lot of money before you get to that point. Um, in Trinity, we have some informal groups, like there's a Tule Creek uh, Road Association. Um, they get together and they do their work days where they go down the road and do the clear all the brush along the side of the road and, and uh, have some little trails and all that kind of stuff. Um, they have tried to uh, hire an RPF as a group most of them signed on for that. So they, they work loosely as a group. Um, they have a little newsletter they put out and that kind of stuff. The concern with that is that um, there's a liability that falls back on each individual landowner. So if they hire an RPF and um, he doesn't get paid, the landowner can, the RPF can sue each landowner even though maybe he only, no, they can take it back. One person signed the contract representing a group, but um, the group all promised to pay and they didn't come and pay. The RPF's going to go back to the guy that he signed the contract with. So, so there's a liability that's shared by each individual um, that doesn't, uh, you don't have that liability with some other uh, group structures. You have the same liability problem with the unincorporated associations. Um, we have one, the High and Palm Growers Association. They're a wine group. They bought equipment together. You can register the name of the Secretary of State. You can come up with your bylaws, your um, articles of association.
Association. You could buy stuff together, you know, own stuff together, but then again, there's still the liability, any liability issue goes back to the individual members. Um, so, you know, the informal groups, unincorporated associations, individuals are liable. Um, if you have the incorporated entities, the next one I'm going to talk about, the nonprofit, they have limited liability. The, individual people, like if you hired a, a forest worker to come in and do your chainsaw work and he got hurt, he could not sue the individual members. He could just sue the assets of the association, of the nonprofit association, if, you know, if he was, um, you know, injured. So, so I'm not explaining this very well, but anyway. If you're getting together with your neighbors, I guess the point is having some sort of corporation, nonprofit, is a good idea if you're concerned about liability. It really depends what your group is going to be having people do. Um, so this last group I want to talk about, which is what we're trying to do in Trinity, is a mutual benefit nonprofit. It's not the same thing as a most of the 501c3 nonprofits that you think about, those are charitable, so they're, they have some educational or, or um, a charitable purpose, and donations to them are tax deductible with IRS, so they're very hard to get. But there's a different 501c, which is a five instead of a three, which is a mutual benefit nonprofit. So you get together with your neighbors for a mutual benefit purpose, and you can um, get this approval by IRS. People can't donate stuff to you and take it off their taxes because you're not charitable. Uh, you can't apply for some grants, but you don't have to pay taxes on your profits. So if you've gotten together with your neighbors, and you're selling stuff, you're buying equipment, and you're protected from liability. Um, you can pay rent to one of the neighbors who stores a piece of that piece of equipment that you bought on his property. You can pay salaries, you know, for, for work that's performed. So you essentially you're taking your profits and putting them, you know, back in to your group and in all these financial ways. And then any profit that you have is not taxable. So anyway, not the mutual benefit nonprofit, the 501c5, uh, is, is potentially a way to get together with all your neighbors and avoid a lot of tax and liability issues. Okay. Um, if you're going to get together with your neighbors, a lot of times one of the neighbors doesn't have a place to put stuff. So we're trying to work on sort yards. Um, the watershed center, this is their sort yard, um, which is in the southern part of the county. We're trying to get one in the central part of the county at the community forest and Sierra Pacific. And we're talking to them about a sort yard at the northern end of the county. So each part of the county would have a place where um, people could take stuff like you were talking about earlier, you could divide it up. You could have these uh, piles of stuff are for chipping into chips. This is for poles. This is for firewood. You get enough stuff, saw logs, whatever. You aggregate enough that you have uh, uh, enough that a tub grinder can come and you know grind stuff for you, or you have enough that um, you can haul a load of logs to the mill or whatever. So the idea is to have a designated place where you can do that. So we're, we're going down that road. And so hopefully I've given you some ideas kind of of different ways to derive some income from your property other than the whole you know, traditional saw logs. And anybody have any questions? We'll take this one. We'll take this one? What lake is that? No, what lake is that? That is Lake Josephine. Well, it's up in the Trinity Alps. It is pretty. It's a privately owned lake up in the Alps.
shops. It's an out parcel in the wilderness area. It's owned by a bunch of doctors from the Bay Area. So you said you have a, a family business. Is your family business your forest business? Is that well, it's, well, my business, I own a laboratory, my small business. Um, but I also, we do, with our property, derive an income, do the Schedule F, um, do all the stuff through Cal Fire to make sure that we're able to sell things. Um, but the income that we derive from the property is, um, from selling things, is only about three to 4000 a year. Your laboratory is not uh, forest-oriented? Uh, or It's for salmon restoration programs. Oh, I measure okay. mud. So I only work in the winter when um, there's uh, turbidity issues. So in the summer, I'm out doing forest products. Mm -hmm. so. I have a good friend who's a special forks, special forest products forester for a large timber company, and that's all he does. He doesn't do anything with any of the day-to-day -day stuff. His job is to, to smooth that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he does, on top of that, he does bear grass, rocks, and other ornamental shrubs, brush that normally gets run over and sprayed and everything else. They dig them up and they sell them. And it's amazing the money they generate from that stuff. It's just absolutely amazing. I mean, the, you, you go to any nursery, you'll see the bear grass. I mean, that's where it's coming from, you know. It's just, uh, You're right. yeah, some people's garbage is other people's treasure, you know, and it's amazing how, how that stuff sells. Sierra, yeah. Sierra Pacific donated um, big boulders to uh, the town of Weaverville when we were putting up our gateway monuments, you know, the welcome to, you know, Weaverville kind of sign. They have these big rocks in front of them. And they were valued to provide matching funds for a grant, and they're valued at five thousand dollars yeah. each. Right. It's amazing. Rocks. Big rocks. Rocks. Even small rocks. I mean, just there's a market for all that for rocks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, brush, shrubs. I mean, and they, you know, you can do Christmas trees as well, like you said. It. You know, you don't have to cut them. You can have people come whack them on your property. You know, or something like that too. I mean, it's just. There's a, there is a lot of money in that stuff if you just know how to put it together. I mean, uh, so my husband, you know, the biologist, he's the retired manager of the Resource Conservation District. He, he takes uh, different kinds of wood, different growth ring patterns, cuts slices with the chainsaw, sands it down, varnishes it, sells it to the schools that are teaching forestry, on, you know, with a little thing on how to... How to tell how old trees are. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, yeah. there's. there's we used some of those there. Right. I don't know if they were his. Carl, we got them from Carl Skinner. Oh yeah. Rings. Yeah, and we used them at the fair for educational purposes, showing fire, years of fire, mm -hmm. and where they started, and how you could tell. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, that's good. And I don't know if any of you have Pacific U. Um, we have some Pacific U on our property that we had to take out for. Um, different buildings and so uh, woodworkers are always looking for uh, strikingly colored grained wood so things like Pacific U they will pay a premium price for a, a lot Pacific U log mm -hmm. so um, I, I really would encourage you just to look with your property with a new eye about you know what what we take for granted that people will buy. You can be used for medicine as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. We've marketed uh, Port Orford cedar, mm -hmm. tight grain Port Orford cedar for tonewood for guitars and ukuleles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it it's very valuable. Mm -hmm. Very, very valuable. I wish I had some. <laughs> <laughs> Have you planted any um, on your property? Port Orford cedar? Yeah. Yeah. Is that, I've been a tree planter. You know, some folks uh, worked out of home quoting a lot, don't know where to. Certain, certain uh, employers would have us go plant a lot of whatever. Yeah, that's the high, highest yeah. planted species right now, right? Mm -hmm. so it has been traditionally for the last 20 years. Timber products. But there is a problem. Yeah, disease. Yeah, lateralis. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, when you have to be really careful of that. Mm -hmm. for cedar diseases. Pretty prevalent for us in the Northwest. And I put in gates for that over the six years. 
you know, exclusion gates and forcers go in. You know, it's a real problem in the winter. It's a water waterborne pathogen, mm -hmm. so it's mainly spread. And then it will go down a, a creek or a stream. So if you see one, it's yeah. likely to go downstream. Get it, you know, yeah. you know, ways to navigate it. I don't know. Well, the same with solder syndrome, death syndrome. And I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, I haven't really encountered in Siskiyou County uh, any obstacles from CAL FIRE or even uh, Department of Agriculture for uh, transporting firewood. In fact, uh, I brought down loads of firewood from Oregon into California, and they just waved me through. <laughs> yeah. No, we're lucky. I mean, if you were, if you were in Del Norte, Humboldt, um, the coastal counties, and you were trying to ship firewood out of those counties, those are quarantine areas. So they wouldn't let you ship firewood out. You, we can ship, from Trinity, we can ship firewood into Humboldt County. But they can't do the reverse. So, um, so yeah, anyway. they ship. I mean, they ship logs from Oregon to Eureka and weed right. by the dozen every day. Logs are coming in. Timber products in Roseburg. One out, and those, those logs are coming out of Oregon. They don't have to do anything. But if you bring seedlings in, you got to pull your teeth out to get those quarantined and get them into this. You know, and most of our uh, most of the trees, a lot of them come from nurseries in Oregon. To get those that, little seedlings. That is going to change though. The, uh, the Skew Arboretum recently got funded by the RAC grant, so they um, you can now buy your trees. Yeah. You'll be able to get trees yeah. more, much more easily, native plants. Of course, Roseburg buys them by millions. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. And every, all the companies, they spread them out, and so they they, uh, they don't put all their eggs in one basket, so they use nurseries in Oregon and BS to get those. You, you got to do a lot of paperwork and but the log trucks, you know, you're pulled over at Hill, doing, filling it out, and the log trucks are just zipping through there. You know, it's like, come on, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. This is our last uh, workshop of the year. We will be, like I said before, we will be having future workshops next year. Um, and so the, though there's a small amount of you, we do have service up there. We're interested in learning about um, what it is you want, want us to be presenting on. What are the better times that would allow you or people who you know to get here. Um, and if there's better venues that we can use for advertising, you know, currently we're emailing, mailing, putting in press releases, but if there's a better way, then you know, we're happy to know for it. The other announcement I want to make is this winter, we will be holding some volunteer events. We're talking about alternative ways of doing forestry. Um, we will be doing two events. We're going to be, we're, we're working with Eric Knapp right now, who if you recall, if you came to the workshop with Carl Skinner, um, Eric Knapp was the person he was talking about in the second half of his presentation. Uh, he's been working in the Stanislaw Experimental Forest. Um, we are going to, we're bringing him up. He's already come up once. He's, he's coming up again. Um, and he will do training for citizen marking. Uh, now, if you, you're doing a big THP or an NTP, obviously you'll still need a RPF to oversee whatever you're doing. But by doing this, we're hoping to bring in some alternative knowledge that so that an individual landowner can go out and decide how best they want to see their property turn into. So we'll have him come up. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get information about that and we'd love to see you guys come out, um, get that training, and then we'll have um, training exercises. So we'll actually go to some properties on Rainbow Ridge um, with flagging instead of paint. And we'll go out and do um, training exercises that you can then take home and do on your own, your own property as well. Um, and then we'll be having another volunteer event working on the conservation easement that Siskiyou Land Trust is working with on Rainbow Ridge, um, doing some help in uh, piling and burning. Um, so that's both of those events we will uh, be emailing you about if you're on our mailing list. And if you're not on our mailing list, I encourage you to sign up. Thanks. Can we get a copy of your presentation? It's being video recorded. I can give you the link. Or just uh, just the, the PowerPoint. Just the PowerPoint. Can you can you get sure. it from her? Yeah. Thanks. And send it out. Sure. I'm great. Well, thank you. It was good. Yeah. 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 Well, that version has like the written notes at the bottom, so I'll send that. So. Yeah. I I wish more people were here because I think those were good. Oh good. Yeah. Appreciate it.